Hey guys, Jordan here with Farm Builder, and for today's daily briefing, we're going to do some Q&A. I put out a post about it a couple weeks ago. Sorry to just be getting around to it now, but here we are. So we'll dive right into it, and I will uh, tag you in the description if you uh, posted this question with a timestamp, so that way if you wanted to go straight to your question, we'll have the answer there for you. So to get right into it, uh, Christopher Mason asked, in your cattle herd, what kind of minerals do you use? So we are using a combination of Fertrail Nutribalancer, uh, it's our poultry Nutribalancer, uh, Thorvin Icelandic Kelp, and then C90 Salt, and essentially equal parts of those three. Um, we found that if you are feeding minerals, keeping a constant supply in front of your cows, um, they will go through about one ounce per head per day, kind of a rough number to work with. All right, uh, QD3612 asked, how often do you rotate in new boars to keep the genetics fresh? So we, <clears throat> first of all, we have a, you know, a fairly large sow herd, about 100 sows right now, and we have six boars that are our primary uh, studs right now. Um, we actually put our boars in pairs. We select them from when they are young, from our own genetics. We have a what's called a closed herd, so we do not bring in genetics from outside our herd into um, our herd anymore. We have closed that pool, and uh, so we are taking uh, boarlings from some of our best sows. We are retaining them, growing them out, and then we use them as pairs. Uh, so there was some research done um, where when you use two boars to cover sows, you get a little bit higher conception rate because interesting fact, unlike most mammals, um, pigs actually conceive over several different copulations. So when you have a couple boars and you put them in with a group of sows, um, there's gonna be a couple go arounds. We'll keep it PG, family show, but you get the idea. And so also you have a backup. If your primary goes down, you have a secondary uh, you know, weapon system. So, and we've had that happen. We've had a boar break his shoulder and, you know, he was down for the count, but his buddy was there and happy to pick up the slack. How often do we rotate them? Generally, we will get about three years out of a set of boars before we will retire them. Usually we're retiring them just because they're getting too big. They're getting seven, 800 pounds. Um, they're bigger than, you know, a lot of the sows that we have and they just kind of outgrow their usefulness. And so we retire them. We are cycling new uh, boars in every year though. So you know, we're retiring a set, bringing a new set on, and we will use those young boars to breed young gilts and, you know, smaller sows. Um, let's see, Bondarosa Farm. What slash who is your main market for your pastured pigs? Um, so a couple different things that, uh, back this all the way up. One of the principles of marketing and what we are employing on our farm and what we teach in our schools is having a profitable sale point at any station of that animal in its life. And then also at any continuation of value adding once it is processed. So we have a price for uh, weaned piglets. We have a price for, say, 200 pound hogs. We have a price for replacement gilts, um, you know, boars. We have a price for a finished live weight hog, 300 pound live weight hog. Um, you know, we have a price for, uh, you know, on the rail carcass weight if someone's buying it for themselves or there's a big customer that wants, you know, say 10 at a time or 20. Um, and then we can value add the cuts, you know, from a primal cut to a restaurant to pork chops that we sell through the farm store, sausage. Um, and then I would say our, our most value added product is we take, we can take pork all the way to a one ounce pork snack stick and everything is priced so that it can turn a profit. So we are free to sell a pig at any position and make money from it. Um, so we sell a lot of piglets to other farms, other pasture based, um, you know, hog farms. Um, and so we sell, you know, send out groups of piglets. Sometimes it's someone wants two. Some of our bigger customers are getting, you know, 50 or 60 at a time. And those are going out, um, going out to those farms pretty regularly. We have most of our piglets we are selling to other farms. We also raise uh, out about 250 uh, animals for ourselves is what we're get what we're planning for this year. So those will be finished 
300 pound hogs that will go and be processed into you know retail ready cuts um, and then we also retire sows every year this year we'll probably retire you know 20 sows or so and those are put into retail ready cuts so you know our main market um, would be retail if we are looking at just straight up the amount of revenue that it brings in um, but if you were to do it by you know how many head we're actually moving most of these animals to other growers all right, on the farm eight, oh, on the farm, sorry, they asked, um, I would be interested to know why you do not just buy your feeder piglets. I've always heard that people that run farrowing operations must not be able to do simple math, but clearly you have some way to make it profitable. Also, I have heard pigs do damage to oak forests. How do you know if your pigs have been in a paddock too long um, or keep them from doing too much damage to the timber? Okay. Um, well, the first one I'll answer is the last question because we've done other videos about that. If you look around the channel, um, there's one, there's some videos about movement, about overseeding, how we time the movement of the animals through the paddock. So I won't go into that one as much here. I would just send you to go look over there. Um, pigs damaging trees. Yes, pigs will damage trees, some more than others. It probably rates its own video, but very quickly, um, any kind of sweet sap tree, so cherries, gums, uh, pears, apples, you know, those kind of uh, peach trees, um, they are going to tear those up, especially in the spring when they're pushing all that sweet sap up into the tree. So you need to be careful about those if you are concerned with keeping those species of trees. Um, pine trees and cedar trees are, you know, kind of in a in an intermediate risk area. They will go after them at certain times of the year, but typically it's going to be February and March when they're pushing sap. Um, hemlock trees, pigs will go after. Um, they go less after the hardwood trees. Sometimes they can get into oak trees. We've really not had much of a problem with that. Um, other trees that are very common on our farm are hickory and black walnut trees, and they do not seem to mess with those at all. I have never seen a, a hickory tree get torn up by pigs. Um, so yes, it is something you do, you have to manage, but also what are, you know, what is the best value of that land? Is it keeping it as timber for that once every 80 years harvest or 60 years harvest? Or if you pencil the numbers, are you making a better return on the acreage by running pigs, even if they do uh, destroy, say, 10% of the trees or 20% of the trees? It's something worth pushing pencils on. For us on our farm, we make far more per acre running pigs um, than we would if every tree on the acre was cut. So, you know, there's an acceptable margin that, hey, we're fine if the gum trees and cherry trees get torn up and gone. We're, we're even fine if the occasional oak tree gets uh, damaged to the point that it dies. We can cut those down, run the logs through the sawmill, firewood, you know, wood chips, what have you. We can salvage those trees. Um, and then, our, you know, black walnuts, as you saw in a previous video, we're trying to develop into more of a silvo pasture type setting where we can have multiple crops going on and, and so on. Um, all right. Why do we not buy in feeder piglets? This is, this is, the answer to this is why we got into farrowing and doing a lot of our own piglets was when we were getting started, we were raising a bunch of pigs and we could not find a steady supply of quality piglets within a four hour drive of us. Um, we were trying to do things at scale. We needed you know, 20, 30, 50 pigs at a time. And it's easy, relatively easy to find six pigs or eight pigs or 10 pigs here and there from the backyard farrower, but it's very hard to find uniform sets uh, of higher quantities of piglets. That was a problem for us because uh, if you don't know, we're about an hour and a half away from Polyface Farm and they raise a lot of pigs. And of course they you know, had most of the farrowers in the area were supplying them. So we backed our way into a farrowing operation, um, not so much to solve an economic problem, but to solve a quality and quantity problem. Now we made the economic uh, you know, issue resolve itself because we were able to factor in our own pricing and to make sure that we are making money at every level. We sell the most expensive piglets in the state um, for you know five, six, seven years now we are the farm that's kind of ice breaking price on piglets. And it's funny to see other operations, um, you know, once we've cleared the path that yes, you can sell piglets for $120 a piece, you know, other farms are starting to charge similar amounts and getting it as well. But the basic, the, the broader principle 
that uh, you know needs to be addressed is you need to have a profitable price at every point. And so if we could not sell piglets at a profit, we would be raising them out to finished hogs, selling them there, and you know, we're value adding it all the way on, as I talked about earlier. Um, and obviously we would not raise as many, but for us, piglets are a very profitable endeavor because we can command a price and not because um, you have to be careful when doing that, that you are solving a problem for your customers and that you are delivering an extremely high level of quality. And so those are things that we do. We're not taking these crappy piglets that you'll see on Craigslist, um, you know, and then just slapping a high price tag on them. These are the best piglets that these farms buy and they have all told us that much. Um, so yeah, you know, the, the, the second part of the question there, uh, people run fairing operations must not be able to do simple math or they just don't have um, the gumption enough to charge a price to be profitable about it. They're, they're looking what we call lateral uh, observation. They're looking at other operators and saying, hey, this guy's only charging $40 a piglet and he's always sold out. So I need to charge the same as him instead of saying, hey, maybe we should just raise our price to a point where this can be profitable. All right. <clears throat> Next question. Turkey Hollow Farm. Do you have any suggestions to those hog farmers that start a, a uh, farrowing operation to primarily supply itself with wieners for finishers, but have a hard time selling the remaining wieners due to a flooded supply of underpriced, undervalued wieners? Feels similar to a cheap egg sales dilemma. So yes, what do you do if you can't move those pigs at a price that's making you a profit? What I would do is I would throttle back my production. I would only produce enough piglets um, to supply my own needs because I know I can make a profit at the retail level or the value added level. So I'm just, I'm going to be my own customer and I'm going to sell them to me at a price that makes me money. Um, reach out though. There are so many requests out there for uh, uniform groups of piglets. I have farms calling me from, you know, you draw a line east of the Mississippi everywhere. And so I think maybe if you, maybe if you looked at your uh, logistics of being able to get piglets to people or putting together groups, you might be able to solve the problem. But if not, just be your own best customer. Throttle back production until you're, you know, you have adjusted the supply chain to the point where a price increase is commanded. Um, I don't recall you ever posting anything about y'all's layer operation. Do you not have one, and why? <laughs> This ties exactly in with what I was just talking about. We used to have uh, between ducks and chickens, uh, four to 5,000 layers on the farm. And guess what? It wasn't profitable. We were struggling to make money. Um, you, know, you have that problem, that yo-yo production of huge amount of eggs in the spring. Of course, everyone else does, so it drives the price down. Um, hard to get production in the fall. Um, and then just the, the grind of doing that every day. Um, so two reasons, one, it was our lowest margin, one of our lowest margin enterprises that we had going. And two, we were just tired of it. And three, there is a um, conglomeration of Mennonite farms near us that do very similar practices to what we were doing. And they are grinding all their own feed. They have their dozen children to work in their enterprise. And they are selling at wholesale at a price that we, we couldn't beat. So we still sell a lot of eggs. They just come from them now and we're one of their biggest customers, and we're just handling, um, you know, we're just value adding by bringing customers to the table. So they're happy, we're happy, our customers are happy, it's win-win-win, and I don't have to worry about foxes getting into my egg layers uh, at night. All right, Rob Johnson uh, asked, do you think you could do a video on the construction of your farrowing huts? Uh, it's probably the most, the, the biggest request I get is for plans on the farrowing huts. Um, there isn't one. It was just, I designed it in my head. We built 20 of them in one weekend. Um, it's something that we've talked a lot about developing a set of plans for it in a tutorial on how to build them. It probably will be something coming down the road, but bear with me guys. There's nothing out there for it right now. I will say if you are looking at pictures of them and maybe the videos, uh, the thing to keep in mind is they are designed for the minimal amount of lumber wastage. So if it's you know an eight foot dimension, it's gonna be a four foot dimension. The sides are cut 
both sides are cut from one sheet of plywood. Um, but we are trying to minimize the amount of lumber that we're using and sheet metal. Uh, Brian McLean asks, can I come and work a day on the farm? Yeah, come on out. We'll put you to work. Bring your A game. Uh, Tori Sledge has two questions. One, what is your advice for those that are just starting out as far as how to properly market your brand and products? Uh, well, we could teach a whole school on that. Um, but yeah, I guess a couple a couple pointers because you mentioned Tori that you know just starting out. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind when you are just starting out. One, never apologize for your price. It's hard if you are not used to selling to ask a high price and to see that look in someone's eyes like, ooh, that's kind of expensive, or maybe even disappointment, or maybe even pushback. Never feel bad about what you need to charge for your product because it's not going to be something that everyone wants or everyone can afford. Um, Andy Frisella has a very good line on there's two kinds of shoppers in the world. There's people who shop for quality and there's people who shop for price. And if you are operating in the direct to retail you know, uh, front of pasture you know, agriculture, you are selling a quality product and not a price product. So if you watch you know, TV and you see ads for different cars, um, if, you look, if you see an advertisement for the buy here, sell here car dealership, what is always up in the corner of the screen or that they lead with or that they're always pushing? Price. If you watch an ad for a higher end car, a really nice BMW, Lexus, what have you, what do you never see as part of the ad uh, until the very end maybe where it's legally obligated? Price. Because what you're selling is quality, not price. And so if you can keep that in mind, as you are designing your retail presence, what you are going to be presenting yourself as, what it's going to look like, um, how you are going to represent your farm, your brand, and yourself. Keep that in mind. You're selling quality, not price, and that needs to uh, just ooze from everything you do. You need to be professional. Um, you need to have quality, you know, etc., and never apologize for your price. So one, one uh, element there. Um, as far as marketing brand, you know, I guess to close that at marketing brand and products, um, just remember you are giving and not asking from your customer. So you need to give, 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 and then ask for the sale. So, you know, there's different rules of thumbs for how you conduct yourself on social media that, you know, maybe every 10 posts, one is a sale or every five or, or what have you, but <clears throat> you get the point of don't always be pushing a sale. What you need to be pushing is that relationship with your customers, that you are there to help facilitate a better life for them. And part of that can be purchasing your products. But even if they don't, you want them to live a better life. And so getting into the, the deep waters of marketing there, but those are two points I think I would offer first. Okay, uh, second question, uh, Tori. Uh, what is the best way for a newbie that is starting with pastured poultry and eggs to market the future beef and pork they are planning to add to their inventory of offerings. All right, so if you have one or two enterprises going, you want to add in some other ones, what's the best way to start preparing the market for that? Um, it's going to be communication. The one thing that you can sell before you have something to sell is the story. You know, cows take a couple of years to grow out. Pigs take nine months. Um, you can start selling that story. So you're not actually requiring money from your customers at this point, but you are presenting the story of we're getting into pigs now. We're getting into cows because we want to you know, capture all of the um, nutrients that the chicken manure is now infusing into the grass. And we want to help close that carbon cycle a little bit more. And you start telling the story of what your future product will be. And of course, you can start having a sign-up sheet. Hey, if you want to know, uh, if you want to be on the reserve list for our beef or pork, um, you know, for our special customers, hey, sign up here. And, you know, at some point, you could open it up for deposits, you know, maybe two months before you're ready to harvest those animals. Say, hey, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have, um, you know, three different bundles 
uh, of pork and maybe four different of beef. Don't start out with 20 different configurations that they can get. Keep it very simple. Have a lower price point, medium and high price point and allow people to reserve those and give you a deposit. That's going to be one of the best ways to introduce a new enterprise to your customer. Now, if you wanted to maybe get something going a lot quicker and you have this ability that you could buy carcasses from another farm that's doing very similar to you and begin to market it right away, you could do that as well. I know some operations that, that have done that. <coughs> All right. Michael Dennett asks, uh, cost of goods sold per piglet, average weaning rates, what age and how many fair wings did you call at? I just called a five-year sow hung at 545. Yes, five, those older sows can be pretty heavy. I think the heaviest one we had was in that high 500s. Um, your butcher basically is treating it like a beef carcass. Um, but, all right, cost of goods per piglet. You got to come to the school for that, Michael, and hit me up. We'll get you down here. Uh, we have a whole sheet where we walk through that. And, you know, not, not that because it's secret information, but... I would rather someone know the process of arriving at a price for a piglet than just say, hey, it's 80 bucks or it's, you know, 90 or 70 or 40 or whatever it is, because that's, that's something that um, I find so annoying in the farming community because it's a harmful and destructive mindset to be in um, that when people ask each other, hey, what are you charging for this? What are you charging for that? It doesn't matter because it needs to be what's profitable for you. You know, what, what I can charge for a product here is going to be different from someone in Florida, New Mexico, Maine. You know, you get the idea. It needs to be um, what your, your price needs to be. And we walk through that process of how to arrive that. But I'll be happy to give that to you, Michael, in a hit me up with a DM or something. Uh, average weaning rates, we want eight. And we will give a sow one pass at a screw up. If she screws up again, it's, you know, and it wasn't our fault. She's going to sausage house. Uh, how many farrowings do we call at? Uh, typically we are getting three to four years out of a sow. What we start calling out for is if they start dropping below that eight uh, average. Obviously if they don't breed after two cycles, we will get rid of them. Um, if a sow is a cannibal, we're going to get rid of her. And after our group, you know, if we have a group of say 12 sows, uh, if they drop below say 50% strength. So, you know, over the years we've called one out for this, called one out for that. And they get down to like six or seven sows that are left. We're going to retire that whole set after their next farrowing and weaning because they've now fallen out of efficiency. We need tight groups of sows that are giving us the numbers of piglets that we need. Okay, last question. Last question here. Um, it is from Luke Porsboro Pedersen. I hope I got that right there, Luke. I'm very curious to know how many acres you use for your farrowing pigs. How long do you rest the areas between farrowing? <coughs> okay, um, this is, again, an answer that's going to be, I can give you the answer for us, and I will in just a second, but for you, it's going to be, contexted to your particular ecosystem. For us here in Virginia, we found a, a stable stocking rate of sows is two to three per acre. And then with our one week to 10 day rotation on the ground in a 80% plus canopy, we can get two to three rotations per year. So what that all means is with a 100 sow um, enterprise, we need at least 50 acres of woods involved in that enterprise. And at any given time, um, all of the sets are only on about two acres in their different areas because we run our sows in homogenous groups from when they are very young and they are autonomous from every other group that's on the farm. So at any given time, one set of sows is on um, you know, a third to a half an acre paddock. They're there for one week, then they move to the next that paddock will have three months, four months of rest before the group of sows comes back through. You can obviously increase those rates when you get to less canopy on the trees. If you have, say, you know, 30% or lower canopy, you probably start adding in more rotations. And if you're on just 100% pasture, you know, and you're rotating every week, you could probably, you know, come back around every six weeks or so. Um, I hope that kind of answers your, your question for you there. But there is no standard rule of thumb on that. You need to know what works. Oh. 
Hope you all enjoyed the uh, Q&A. Um, uh, you know, I'll tag you in the descriptions for where your spot is and uh, put a brief description there so you can jump forward if you're watching it. Uh, appreciate the questions. Feel free to submit some more. We'll compile uh, you know, another list of these together to do at some point here in the future. A couple of things I would ask if you were enjoying these videos, please share them in any social media groups you happen to be in. Uh, we appreciate that. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell, all that crap that YouTubers like to tell you. I guess we're kind of doing that thing now. And again, thanks for coming by. Our goal here is to give information that helps grow uh, pasture-based livestock systems at scale, supporting full-time incomes. There's a lot of guys that do a lot of great content for you know, kind of smaller scale stuff, hobby farms. What we're trying to do is deliver content on doing this thing at scale actually making an income for your family and for employees and for however big you want to scale your business out to be, our goal is to help facilitate that. So we appreciate you. Come on back around. And until next time, get after it.